again, Greenville. Great to be able to worship with you this morning. Hope that you had a good week and looking forward to this time together in God's Word, time to sing some songs together, to pray together, and to hear from the Scriptures. I did want to share with you, I believe most of you already know, but uh, it's been a week already. Last Sunday evening, uh, Ted Carr went home to be with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to continue to pray for Amy and for Ted and Amy's children and just for our church family as we grieve this loss. We do grieve as those who have hope because we know that Ted is worshiping Jesus face to face on this Sunday. But the rest of us remain here and will miss him and miss the relationships, the the joy, the love, just that we've experienced in traveling in this journey with Ted and his family. So please continue to pray for him, his family, uh, pray for us as a church, and may we really see all the ways that God has used this difficult and, and bad situation and used it for so much good. I am grateful to the Lord to have known Ted and to see how God has worked through Ted and through Amy and through their family during all of this trial. So we give God the glory. I also want to let you know that the relaunch team met for the first time last week and we just began to talk about all the different aspects of what's required to restart in-person worship, uh, Sunday morning worship services for Greenville. And we all agree that we need to take our time because the safety of our church as well as the quality of the experience of worshiping together as a church family are top priorities for us. We would love to meet right away, but we know it's not realistic for us as a church. So we're going to take our time and we're going to do our best to give us an awesome experience when we finally are able to meet again in person. One that's not marked with any fear or any distance or coldness, but instead has that spirit of love, the the presence of the Holy Spirit. We are prioritizing a process over trying to pick a time. So I will keep you as informed as I can each step of the way. I also want to keep you informed continuously about the activity that's going on here on the church campus with improvements for the buildings, for the parking lot, for the sanctuary. It's exciting to see Earth is being moved and and space is being cleared out and even work has begun in the Life Center and it's neat to see how it unfolds each step of the way and I know when we get to meet together it's going to look different and it's going to be exciting to see a beautiful sanctuary. I'm so thankful for the men and women who are working so hard up to this point. The project, of course, isn't close to being done. It's going to take a while, but uh, there's real progress that's being made. And so continue to pray for your church and for the leadership, both the relaunch team as well as the campus improvement team and the different people who are serving there. Uh, And we thank you for all the many ways that the church has contributed for, uh, for the life of this body to grow and to see us using God's, the resources God has given us to the best of our ability. Uh, I wanted to let you know about a couple of meetings that are happening, one today and one tomorrow. Tonight at six o'clock, we're going to have a church-wide prayer meeting. It's going to be using GoToMeeting. You can go to our website and you can get the login information there, and we hope you'll join us tonight at six o'clock. Uh, Last month when we did this, it was great. There was a little bit of time of fellowship. We prayed for one another. Lots of different people were able to interact with us. So I pray that you'll join us tonight at 6 o'clock for a church-wide prayer meeting. And then tomorrow evening at 6.30, that's Monday evening at 6.30, I'm inviting you to join me with a young lady that I've recently met. Her name is Rachel, and she's friends with some people within our church. She has served in East Asia with an organization called Crew, and it's a gospel mission. She served on campuses last year in East Asia, and she's looking to go again in the fall. But she needs support, she needs prayer, she needs financial support, and she wants to share this ministry that she has with you so that you can pray for her and consider partnering with her, and just to be able to see the exciting things that God is doing uh, in countries that are closed or countries that are not traditionally Uh, gospel 
focused countries. And so students are coming to Christ. Students are being transformed. They're hearing good news. So I hope you'll join me tomorrow. This is using Zoom, but again, you can go to our website and you can get the login information for this Zoom meeting with Rachel tomorrow. So I hope you'll join me. It'll be an exciting time. And then the last thing that I wanted to mention is that today is Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday is when we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit for the church. Of course, God's Spirit had been working from before the beginning of creation. But God had promised that He would pour out His Spirit upon His church in a new, fresh, and unique way so that all who believe in Jesus Christ, all who follow Him, are indwelt by the empowering presence of God Himself. The Holy Spirit, called the Comforter, called the Advocate, has indwelt us as believers. That happened in a radical, exciting way in Jerusalem first with the original apostles in the early church there at the, the festival of Pentecost when the Spirit was poured out and even visibly manifested Himself with flames of fire over the heads of the apostles and they spoke in languages so that all who were there men and women from all nations that had come to worship in Jerusalem for that festival heard the good news preached in their own language it was the beginning of a spread that continues to this day around the world of the power of the Spirit combined with the gospel message making an impact for all people. We're the recipients of that. The gospel has come to us because of the power of the Holy Spirit. The gospel has penetrated our hearts because of the Holy Spirit. So today, Pentecost Sunday, we thank God for sending the Holy Spirit. And even the sermon message out of Hebrews, it's not a Holy Spirit-focused message in that sense. It's, it's primarily focused on Jesus, but how fitting, because what the Spirit does is He points us to Jesus. And so this message, I'm praying, is a Holy Spirit-empowered message that will penetrate your heart and mine and help us to follow Christ fully. Even Jesus, our passage is going to tell us, even Jesus was empowered by the Holy Spirit to lay down His life as a sacrifice. We need the Holy Spirit, and on Pentecost Sunday, we thank God for the Holy Spirit. So let's bow our heads for just a moment and pray and thank God for this opportunity to worship Thank God for this church family, and thank God for the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have not left us alone. You have not abandoned us. First, you sent your Son to rescue us from sin, and then you sent your Spirit to indwell us so that we might live for you. We might be able to turn from sin and embrace the good news, and that we might be able to bear fruit fruit in our own lives through sanctification, and fruit of seeing more and more people come to Jesus through the good news. So Lord, this morning may our worship be pleasing to you. May the songs we sing be sweet sounds in your ear. May the word that is preached reach into the depths of our soul and change us because we will encounter you in your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. This Pentecost Sunday, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, why don't we join together and proclaim the faith that we believe by singing this worship song, and it's called just that, We Believe.
Good morning, Greenville Baptist Church. I'd like to start our prayer time off with a portion of reading from the song of thanksgiving that David had written in 1 Chronicles. Ascribe to the Lord, O clans of the people. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. And let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the, let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Save us, O oh God, of our salvation, and gather and deliver us from among the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory to your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praised the Lord. Holy and merciful God, we come before you and thank you for your love that does endure forever. You are our rock. You are our redeemer. Holy Spirit, continue to do a mighty work in your church, in this world that we live in. Lord, in the many things that are unknown, even in the near future, Lord, we come before you and ask for your guidance, your wisdom. We trust your leading. We lean on you for those things we don't understand, but we trust the outcome will glorify you. Lord, we, we do have many prayers in our church, in our family. We have the cars. We have Amy Carr and all her children. We pray for the funeral, private funeral that will be held this weekend. We pray for Amy to be strong. Pray for the children, from the younger ones to the older ones, that you will fill their hearts Fill those voids, Lord, and help them in this difficult time. Lord, I pray for Deb Morrison, uh, and uh, we pray for the granddaughter, Shelby, who has lost her life in the car accident. We ask for your grace and, your, and to be merci merciful in those uh, situations, Lord. And Lord, grant them peace and uh, guide them through this with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray the prayers for many of our, in our church who are still struggling uh, with uh, possibly finances and, and jobs and family members who may be sick and uh, just living in this time through this pandemic and that you would help them in their worries and in their grief. Lord, we also pray for and um, thank you for the church projects that are still going forth, that are starting, that new things are evolving each and every day uh, with, with new and exciting changes throughout the church that we pray in the end uh, will glorify you uh, through the people and their hearts and a place to, that really represents you, an excellent place of worship. Lord, we pray for unity through this time uh, because uh, people uh, struggle, they're frustrated, they're lonely, they're looking for answers. And Lord, throughout the world and in our church, Lord, and we just ask that you would unite us together until that day comes when we will be re reunited, worshiping in our churches together once again. Until that time, Lord, that you would be our stronghold, that you would be our rock and hold us 
hold us strong in our homes, in our families, and in the in the church. And Lord, we certainly also pray for um, our offerings, Lord. Uh, the offerings that continue to come in that you keep blessing us with. To continue to do the things that we can do to prepare our church for the days to come in ministry, in the vision you have for your church here at Greenville. Lord, I thank you for all those in our church and that you would bless them, encourage their hearts, lift them up at this time, and that you would pour out your grace upon each one of us in our own personal circumstances <clears throat> to overcome those, uh, those trials uh, we may be facing and uh, connecting uh, where we can. Lord, you surely are with us even today. We sense your presence, we feel your presence, and we thank you for your faithfulness to us. Lord, let us pray the prayer you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Bless you all this morning. Peace be with you throughout the week. Amen.
Good morning, Greenville. I love and miss you all, and we're praying for you as a church. Our scripture reading for this morning is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verses 1 through 14. Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, an Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties, but into the second only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls, and with the ashes of a heifer, sanctifies for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 14, the word of the Lord. Have you ever walked in on a conversation between two friends that have a history that goes back together and they're talking about times and places and people that you're not familiar with? Honestly, I think that's what reading the book of Hebrews is for a lot of Christians. We kind of follow along in the conversation and maybe even laugh at a few things or, or, or sense what their important things that they're talking about are. But in general, there's all these holes or gaps in our understanding as we try to listen to that conversation. And likewise, there are a lot of gaps and holes for many of us when we're reading the book of Hebrews because it was a letter written for Jewish Christians in the first century. And none of us live in the first century, and very few of us have a Jewish background, and even those who do have a Jewish background that's 2,000 years later, not one that grew up knowing about the temple and the worship that went on there. And so there really is a lot of missing pieces that we need to have filled in if we're going to understand this living word that still speaks to us today. So that's what I want to do this morning as a start. I want to fill in some of the gaps, and specifically, we're going to have to gain a little bit more understanding of the tabernacle and what that is, and that will help us as we read this passage. I believe it'll help it come alive and give us a better sense of what it is that the writer was telling that church so that then we can hear what the Holy Spirit is telling us through this word today. Now before we do that, let's go ahead and bow our heads for a word of prayer and ask for the Holy Spirit's help on this Pentecost Sunday as we read this word together. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the scriptures, for the word of God. We thank you that this is a living and active word that still speaks to us today. 
Would you help me to communicate it clearly? Would you help me to fill in some of those gaps so then we can follow along in the conversation that is meant for us to be taught by and learned by just as much as those original readers? And Father, would you help each one of us to take this word and not just have new knowledge, but have new affections and new love and new faith in you because of what we read here. So Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As a church, we've been going through the book of Hebrews, and we've now entered chapter 9. But in chapter 8, we were introduced to the idea that Jesus has inaugurated a new covenant between God and man that was meant to replace the covenant that God had made with Israel at Mount Sinai. And the old covenant was encapsulated with, by the Ten Commandments, by the tabernacle and later the temple, and by, of course, the sacrificial system. This was outlined in the first five books of the Old Testament, often called the Pentateuch, where we get the story of the beginning of creation and then the beginning of Israel and the covenant there that God made with them. But the point that the writer of Hebrews is going to make is that the covenant that Jesus makes is greater than the covenant that was made with Israel at Sinai. So now that we've reached chapter 9, He's going to extend this discussion about the tabernacle. And I want to stop just long enough to say, I'm going to sometimes use interchangeably tabernacle and temple. They were two different things, but they were in essence served the same purpose. It began as the tabernacle, which I will describe in a moment, and then later became the permanent structure known as the temple. Solomon built it, and then it was destroyed, and it was rebuilt. And then actually it was still being built and it had been finished off in Jesus' own day. But there, the tabernacle and temple, I'm going to use those interchangeably. And the writer of Hebrews here, in the first seven verses, he's really going to dive into some detail about the tabernacle or the temple. And he's going to explain things, or not really explain them, he's just going to talk about things because the, writer, the readers of this letter would have known what he was talking about. All the pieces of furniture and the activities that went on there, they'd had a basic familiarity with them. But for us, it, it is new. So I'm going to spend a few moments and explain the tabernacle. What was this tent-like structure? What was it all about and what were a few key elements in it? So that then when we read it, it makes sense to us. We're not going to do an in-depth study of every element that's there and, and exactly how it was built. But the general overview will help us because the writer is going to use this tabernacle as a picture of an important truth of the new covenant that Jesus inaugurated. So the tabernacle, God told Moses how to build it, exactly what he wanted it to look like, right down to the types of fabric that were to be used for this tent-like structure, of the, the distance and the, the length, what was supposed to go inside of it, and the activities that were supposed to happen there. And this is related to us in the book of Exodus. Now, the tabernacle, as I said, it was a temporary structure. It was a tent-like structure that was designed to be able to move with the people of Israel because when they first received this instruction, when they first entered into the covenant there at Mount Sinai, they had not arrived where God was bringing them. They were a wandering people. And actually because of their sin, they wandered for 40 years and the tabernacle stayed with them. And it was always to be erected in the center of the camp with the tribes all having their tents set up around this central tabernacle, this central tent of worship. And that's what the tabernacle was. It was a place of worship where God said he would make his presence dwell among the people there in that tabernacle. And it would be the center of the worship life for the people of Israel. And it, exists, it consists of three different parts, if you will, three different parts of the structure. And I want to go through quickly each of those parts. First, there is the courtyard. The courtyard uh, had an outer wall that was made with fabric and, and poles, 
and it could be moved, but then it could also be quickly set up, and it kept outsiders, it kept people outside of the temple unless they came in through the main entrance there for the purpose of worship. And what happened in the outer courtyard was that's where the animals were sacrificed, where the blood was poured out. We talked about that a little bit last week, where the carcasses there were burned. And then there was also, so there was the altar that was there. And then there was also a basin for washing, ceremonial washing for the priest. All that took place in the outer part of the tabernacle. And any Israelite could enter in there for the purpose of worshiping God, for coming close to God, especially through sacrifice. So that's the courtyard. The second part was called the holy place. Now this was actually a covered tent. And inside this, only the priest could go. The priest would go in and minister inside the holy place. And there were three important pieces of furniture that were inside the holy place. There was the, the lamp stand or the candle stand that was to remain continually lit, reminding us that God is light. And so in there was a lamp that was always kept lit. If you, as you walked in, that would be on your left-hand side. On the right-hand side would be a table, and each day, 12 loaves of bread, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, were laid out as, a, as an offering to God, sometimes called the showbread. There, the showbread and the table there that it was set upon would have been on your right-hand side. And then straight ahead, there would have been another altar, but this altar wasn't for animal sacrifices. It was an incense altar where they would burn incense that would be like a sweet aroma to the Lord that would remind them of the presence of God that was there at the tabernacle. That was all in, in an enclosed structure, a tent-like structure called the holy place. But then there was a final and third section that you had to go through the holy place to enter into the most holy place. It was cordoned off with a veil, and only the high priest, once a year, could go into the holy place, the most holy place, sometimes called the Holy of Holies. And inside there was the Ark of the Covenant. It was a golden box that housed the command, the covenant itself, the tablets written by God with the Ten Commandments on them, rested inside this golden box or ark, along with a jar of manna that was preserved from the time of the wilderness wandering, the food that God gave the people of Israel to eat, and then also the staff that Aaron had that miraculously had budded, that God had called, caused to bud to prove or demonstrate that Aaron was the real priest of God. So these things were in this golden box, and on top of that golden box, so as part of the, the lid that went on there, that lid is often called the mercy seat or the covering, and that's going to be important throughout the book of Hebrews. But that lid also had two angels carved into it, like uh, statues of angels called cherubim. And the high priest would go in once a year, and of course, he would never go in without blood. But we'll get more into that in just a moment. But you see the, the three parts, the courtyard, and then there's the holy place, and then behind another veil was the most holy place. And that is where God said he would make his presence known. Over the mercy seat, the Spirit of God would dwell. The most significant aspect of the tabernacle that the writer of Hebrews is going to draw our attention to, that he wants us to focus in on, is the two-part sanctuary made up there of the holy place and the most holy place, or the holy of holies. And the aspect of this two-part sanctuary that he's going to emphasize the most is the limited access into the holy of holies. As a teenager and a young adult, I went to my share of rock concerts. 
but never once did I get to go backstage and hang out with the artists themselves. I always wish I had that, that lanyard with the pass that you could just walk up to where the security guards are in the door and you just show them the pass and they open the door and you are given access to the presence of the performers and you get to have an intimacy with them because you're backstage. But unfortunately, I never got that backstage pass. Now, we can think of, in some ways, the Holy of Holies like the backstage of the tabernacle. Access was strictly limited. But rather than being the presence of a rock band, it was the presence of God himself. The inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, was designed by God as the place where His presence would dwell with His people Israel. And so access was strictly limited, even among the priesthood, to only the high priest. And he could only go once a year on the Day of Atonement, and he could only go bringing blood from a sacrifice, blood that would be used as an atonement for his sins, the high priest's sins, as well as the sins of the people. The writer of Hebrews explains in verse 6, he says, These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, the holy place. They go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties, but into the second, into that holy of holies or that most holy place, only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. So we see that the tabernacle itself regulated who and how and when people could come into the presence of God. Access to God was limited. In verse 9, the writer tells us very plainly that the tabernacle and the priestly duties performed there are symbolic. They point beyond themselves. They point forward in time, and they also point deeper than earthly realities. So what has come before was intended to teach us about what was to come, what in reality now has come through Jesus. So he says there in verse 9, he says, these things that he's just been talking about are symbolic for the present age. They are pictures pointing to the reality that now exists. They are shadow versus reality. They inherently had in them a symbolic element that pointed beyond itself. So returning to the question of access to God that we were just talking about with the backstage pass and all of that, we look at verse 8 and we're told that the Holy Spirit was teaching us through the tabernacle that access to God was limited or restricted as long as the tabernacle itself was the means that we were using to access God. I'd like to someday try virtual reality. You know the thing where you, you put on the mask and, and the headphones and, and then you're sort of immersed into some kind of setting that normally you wouldn't be able to, to be in. Maybe it's a, a fantasy world or a combat scene, maybe it's space flight or zero gravity, any, anything. And the technology to, for this experience is so immersive that it feels like you're really experiencing those things. But of course, you're not. And, and the, the mask that is on your face and the, the headphones pressing against your ears are reminders that it is like reality, but it falls short of reality. Now, I think we can take that image and it'll help us understand the tabernacle and more broadly, the Old Covenant in general. The, the Old Covenant and its tabernacle, they allowed Israel to enter into relationship with God. I mean, that's what a covenant is. It's a formal relationship between two parties. So the Old Covenant and the tabernacle there that was used for worship allowed Israel to enter into a relationship with God. But it was, by its very nature, a limited relationship, a limited access, a limiting the true access to God. And so the, the house of worship, the tent of worship that God instructed them to build, 
showed in itself that that relationship came to this point, but then true access to God himself was limited behind a curtain or behind a veil. Now, the restriction wasn't because God is just reclusive or, or exclusive or even that he's mean or something like that and doesn't want people around. The restriction was due to the reality that our sin has obliterated our true relationship with God that he created us for. Our sin is the barrier that keeps us from being able to access God. And the tabernacle just put that into a picture. The Old Covenant was a symbol pointing us forward to genuine, or pointing us back to or forward to real relationship with God. It was showing us the need for atonement. It was showing us the, the promise of God's presence. But like virtual reality, it stopped short of being able to actually provide what it pointed to. That's because the Old Covenant was never meant to, and the tabernacle was never meant to be the end of God's plan. It was never meant to be how we access God for eternity. It was meant to point us forward. It was symbolic for the present age that Jesus has ushered in. And so it was part of a bigger plan that finds its climax in Jesus and in the work on the cross, in his resurrection, and in his ascension, in the new covenant that he has inaugurated. The old covenant pointed to the real thing, real forgiveness of sins, real access to God, real eternal life. But these things only come to us in reality through Jesus and the new covenant. More specifically, the reality of these blessings come to us because of Jesus' sacrificial death and because his role as our high priest, as we saw last week, his role is our go-between for us and God. His blood paid for our sins. His life gives us full access to God. The gifts and sacrifices in the tabernacle under the Old Covenant, as verses 9 and 10 are going to show us, they only dealt with external realities. They couldn't actually perfect or make whole the conscience or the inner person. So he says there in verse 9, according to this arrangement, the, the tabernacle and the things that went on there, the gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. But, verse 10 says, but... When Jesus came to earth, living, and then dying, and then being raised to life again, and ascending to heaven, he did what the old covenant could only point to but couldn't accomplish. He entered into the true inner sanctuary, inner sanctuary, the true presence of God, as verse 11 shows us, the true dwelling place of God. He entered into heaven. Not bringing the symbols, not bringing the blood of goats or of calves or, or the ashes of a heifer, but the true sacrifice of his own blood as a full atonement, a full covering for our sins, and opening the way for full access through him to God. Verse 11 explains it this way, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent. He's talking here about heaven itself, the one that the earthly tent pointed to, that showed that it was a reality. This more, this greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. And then it says, he entered, Jesus entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. So the writer here in verse 12 has described that Jesus' sacrificial death is what has secured an eternal redemption. It's not a short-term fix. It's not a symbol pointing beyond itself, but the reality of full forgiveness and salvation. 
And then in verses 13 and 14, it tells us that the, the symbols of the goat's blood or the bull's blood, the sacrifice, sacrificed animal's blood, if it had the power under the Old Covenant to cleanse externally, how much more will the blood of Jesus, the Son of God, have the power to cleanse us to our very core, to our inner being, to the real person that we are? In Jesus, we've moved from shadow to reality, which means that our salvation is real, which means that we are freed from our works that lead only to death, freed from attempting to earn the love of God or earn a place in heaven, freed just from spinning our wheels and trying to do things in our own power. We're freed from that way that leads to death so that we can live and that we can serve the living and loving God. I love the way that this passage ends. Then it says in verses 13 and 14, If the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify, that is purified or made clean, uh, if they sanctify for the purification of the flesh, the outer person, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will it purify our conscience? Our conscience. Not talking about just that little voice that tells us what's right or wrong, but the true self, the inner person. How much more will it purify our conscience from dead works? Purify us from all the stuff that we're trying to do that lead only to death to serve the living God. That's the reality that has become ours in Jesus. Listen, church, access to God is finally a reality through Jesus Christ. His sacrifice for our sins cleanses us and then clears the way for us to go back into relationship with God. Silly as it was, I want you to return with me to that backstage pass illustration. You know, you can't buy a backstage pass to God, but something even better has happened for you. You see, the star of the show has left backstage and he's come out into the audience and he's come to you and he's put his arm around you and he has walked you to that, to that door and there's security guards there and he simply says, he's with me. And they open the door and they say, go on in. See, Jesus has come in the flesh to give us access to God. He is our backstage pass. His blood has already paid the price for our sins. We are welcomed back into the relationship with God that he designed us for. Jesus has acted on our behalf, doing what would be impossible for us. See, our works, they get us nowhere. They lead to death. But Jesus died and was raised that we might live, that we might be forgiven, that we might have access to God. And the invitation that Jesus gives to you is to put your faith in what he has done. Trust in who he is and what he has done instead of yourself. And then you can be cleansed of your sins. You can be given full access to God right here and now and in eternity. You see, our brother Ted, last Sunday, he came to that door he faced death, and he just had to hold up a backstage pass covered in the blood of Jesus and say, this gets me access into the presence of God. And the angels opened the door and welcomed him in where he is now experiencing direct access, no limitation. He is worshiping God face to face because of what Jesus did for him. And the invitation is there for you and I. That backstage pass has already been secured. Will we trust Jesus enough to put it on? Will we turn from our dead works, turn from our disobedience to God and from our fruitlessness of trying to live life for ourselves and by ourselves and instead embrace what Jesus has done on our behalf and to walk in that reality and experience the forgiveness and eternal life that God 
wants for us and has made possible for us through Jesus Christ. If you've never done that, today you can have access to God. Today you can have the security of knowing that when you die, your death will not be a defeat. It will be a victory leading to life because of what Jesus has done. And if you have already done that, live in that light. Live in the reality that you have access to God, that He is your Father, and that nothing, no sin can separate you from Him. No discouragement, no circumstance can keep you from full access to God through Jesus Christ. And He has given you His Holy Spirit. It's Pentecost Sunday. Remember, He has given you His Holy Spirit. He has given me the Spirit of God that I might walk, that you might walk in a manner worthy of Him, that we, we might live our lives serving our living and loving God. Today, embrace that. Remember, through Jesus, we have access to God. Trust in Him and Him alone. Thank you, church, for looking at the Word of God together with me. I hope it's been encouraging to you. I hope you'll go back and reread Hebrews chapter 9 and that it'll come alive for you as you realize that Jesus' blood is not a symbol. It's not like the blood of goats and the blood of bulls. It's a reality that atones for and covers our sins and we can walk freely into God's presence through Jesus. Let's live like it. Let's love the access that God has given us to him through Jesus. And I want to leave you with a final word, a word of hope, a reminder of the reality that we have in Jesus Christ. And this comes from Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you might abound in hope. Go in this hope. God bless you. Lost,